Our quest to visit every single town in Puerto Rico continues. So far, we've dropped by Carolina, Trujillo Alto, and Gurabo. And this week, we stop by the town of Caguas, Centro y Corazón de Puerto Rico, Center and Heart of Puerto Rico, as they like to call themselves. Except that the geographic center of the island is way to the west, in the Pellejas Ward of Orocovis. As for the heart, well, that's a sentimental matter. I guess, if you're a cagüeño, it definitely is. In any case, Caguas is a great town. Its mayor, William Miranda Torres, son of the late William Miranda Marin, has done a great job keeping the city clean, safe, and economically thriving. The best way to get to Caguas, if you're coming from the Isla Verde area, is over the Teodoro Moscoso Bridge. If you're coming from Condado or Old San Juan, your best bet is through the Minillas Tunnel. Either way, you'll end up on State Road 18 going south. Stay on the left two lanes. After a few miles, you'll take the exit left towards Toll Road 52, also going south. From that point on, you'll drive about 10 miles. Stay on the center lane until you reach exit 18 that reads Bayroa Valle Tolima. Take the service road and take the right hand lane. At the light, Turn right and you'll be on Avenida Jose Garrido. Follow that road to the very end and you'll arrive at an intersection with Municipal Road 156.
From there, we're going to drive straight across to the William Miranda Marin Botanical and Cultural Garden. Of all the places that we visited in Caguas, this was the most disappointing. So why start here? First, it was the most logical in terms of its geographical location. And second, I thought it would be best if I just got it out of the way. That way, our visit could only get better with time. According to the Municipality of Caguas's website, the William Miranda Marin Botanical and Cultural Garden is a living museum that extols Puerto Rican culture in relation to nature and tropical agriculture. They also add that it offers beautiful trails to explore, educational tours, and spaces for special activities. Well, <laughs> we didn't see them. The place is certainly well-groomed and beautiful, granted. But as far as tours, education, and above all, signage, I'd be generous to say that it was lacking. I mean, come on, being that it's supposed to be a botanical garden, aren't you supposed to know what you're looking at? Furthermore, aren't you supposed to learn about the different plants? After all, they're calling it a botanical garden. Our first negative impression came at the very entrance, when we paid the $4 per person admission. I know, $4 is nothing, but the lady had a brochure stuck to the counter with scotch tape and she told us to photograph it with our phones so we'd know what we were looking at. Come on, for $4, at least they should give you a 5 cent photocopy of the map, don't you think? So during the next hour or so, we wandered around the place without learning a thing. And as for the tours, <laughs> we didn't see those either. So here are some ideas. Maybe management could install little signs with the name of each plant and a QR code. Reading that QR code could lead to written details about each plant, or even better, to an audio explanation in two or three languages. That way, it would all be paperless. I mean, being that it's a botanical garden, the last thing that you want to do is chop down trees to print brochures, right? We finally got tired of the place and headed to the old town of Caguas. Don't take me wrong, Caguas is a huge place, but most of it is urban sprawl. Like most cities in Puerto Rico, the original town is way smaller. When we got there, they were celebrating a Feria Agricola Familiar, which in English would be an itinerating farmer's market. Permanent farmer's markets are a thing of the past in most of Puerto Rico, and supermarkets have taken over. This leaves small farmers without a place to sell their products. So many towns celebrate 
itinerating fares. They start early in the morning and by noon, everybody's gone. Finding parking took a little while because of the fare, but we finally found a spot next to the Santiago R. Palmer Square. Like many towns in Puerto Rico, mayors have installed parking meters all over the city. The money collected helps keep the city clean and the city streets up to date. And the ones in Caguas are the modern kind, that work with credit or debit cards. That way, there's no coins to collect. And the meter maids? Well, let's just say that they stay on top of things. So pay your parking and avoid the fine. The Santiago R. Palmer Square is one of the largest and nicest in Puerto Rico. It dates back to the 18th century when the old village of San Sebastián del Barrero became the original town of Caguas. It has excellent tree cover, benches everywhere for people watching, and even a pair of permanent residents called Hugo and Maria, like two of the most vicious hurricanes that have ravaged Puerto Rico in decades past. One prominent feature is a giant clock that sits across the street from the town's Dulce Nombre de Jesus Cathedral. The clock is beautiful and certainly draws attention, but don't set your watch to it because it doesn't work. Right across the street, at one end of the Santiago R. Palmer Square, we visited the beautiful Dulce Nombre de Jesus Cathedral. This majestic structure was built in the same place where the Dulce Nombre de Jesus Hermitage once stood. In 1830, it became the Church of Caguas Village, and its facade had only one tower. During the 1930s, it was remodeled once again, only this time they added the second tower. Inside the cathedral are the remains of Puerto Rico's beatified Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, a native son of Caguas that we'll cover later. Now, here's something that's just my opinion. You know how many churches of all denominations can sometimes seem dark and musty? Well, not this one. It has beautiful, large stained glass windows everywhere, making the interior bright and lovely. I don't know if it's my astigmatism, but I gravitate towards bright places. I just love it. Leaving the Dulce Nombre de Jesus Cathedral, we walked across Santiago de Repalmer Square to what used to be City Hall, La Casa Alcaldía, or La Casa del Rey, like they used to say during Spanish colonial times. Today, City Hall is at a different location altogether, and the old City Hall building houses the Caguas Museum of History, or Museo de Historia de Caguas. Like the name suggests, the Caguas Museum of History takes you on a historic journey from pre-Columbian Caguas to the 20th century. There's also a room dedicated to former Governor Luis Muñoz Marín with important documents and photographs. On the second floor, there's a gallery with paintings of every Caguas mayor since 1898. We only got to see half of this museum. We didn't see the Luis Muñoz Marin room or the paintings on the second floor. Even so, we spent well over an hour going through every stage in the development of this interesting city. The one thing that caught our eye the most was the work of Edwin Baez Carrasquillo an artist that combines painting, modeling, sculpting, and woodworking to create lifelike miniatures that are simply breathtaking. The dioramas that are in the first room and the extended collection that's in the second one that is dedicated exclusively to his work are absolutely stunning. And apparently, Baez has won the hearts of Los Cagüeños because his work is present in many other museums throughout the city. The man is simply a genius. You could spend a week exploring Caguas, but we had only a day. So we explored several other museums belonging to La Ruta del Corazón Criollo. La Ruta del Corazón Criollo is a network of museums peppered through the old town that tell the story of the people of Caguas. It was the brainchild of the late William Miranda Marín, former mayor of the city and father to the present mayor, William Miranda Torres. We explored the ones that caught our eye the most and left those that were either closed or we couldn't find. After all, we did approach city officials twice and never received an answer, so we did it like any other tourist would, on our own and as best we could. From the Caguas Museum of Art, we moved to the Herminio Torres Grillo Tobacco Museum, 
Museo del Tabaco Herminio Torres Grillo, the only one of its kind on the island. Regardless of your views towards tobacco and the act of smoking as a whole, the fact remains that this was one of the most important agricultural crops of the 19th and 20th centuries. This little museum is filled to the brim with information and relics from this bygone era. There are even miniatures, once again by Edwin Baez Carrasquillo, illustrating the process of tobacco farming and cigar making. There's even a real live cigar maker that produces actual cigars right before your eyes. Like in all other museums that we visited, the attendant was knowledgeable and pleasant. But the operative word here is attendant. The fact is that we only detected one attendant per museum. I wonder if we got the wrong impression or if it was actually the case. If it is, what happens if several tourists show up concurrently or if the person calls in sick? I confess that I didn't ask. After leaving the Tobacco Museum, we went straight to the Museum of Popular Art, Museo de Arte Popular, which is just across the street. There too, there was only one attendant, who was pleasant, knowledgeable, and went out of her way to cover every detail of this museum. This is one place where you could spend several hours, as there are marvelous pieces and lots of information. The museum is dedicated mainly to Caguas-born artists, but there are some that are from other parts of the island. From the Museum of Popular Art, we walked about two blocks to the Caguas Art Museum, or Museo de Arte de Caguas, where we were lucky enough to see a marvelous collection by the late Luis Manuel González, another Caguas great that left its mark in Expressionism. The Caguas Museum of Art has a permanent collection that it combines with itinerating collections to present a constantly changing mix of fresh offerings. Among the permanent collection, there are four huge paintings by the late great Puerto Rican painter from the town of Coamo, Domingo Garcia. Garcia was a painter, a sculptor, and printmaker with a career spanning six decades. Our host explained the four paintings, and in doing so, covered several important aspects of Puerto Rican history. Like Ruben Santos, in the neighboring town of Murabo, he used the paintings as a tool to teach history. As in all of the prior museums, the attendant was knowledgeable and friendly. But once again, there was only one. When we were just about to leave, our guide introduced us to a unique piece of art that's hidden towards the back of the museum. It's a combined piece by painter Artemio Rivera Casillas and woodworker Edgardo Rodriguez Luigi, both from the town of Arecibo on the northwestern coast of Puerto Rico. At first sight, it looks like a mural with a wooden house placed in front of it. The mural depicts the Turabo Valley where the town of Caguas is located. The house illustrates the old style wooden shacks where Puerto Ricans used to live. But there's much, much more to it. The house is actually a time capsule created in 2002. It contains drawings from elementary school children of the time who were asked to imagine Caguas in the year 2025 and produce a drawing. The capsule is set to be open on May 1st, 2025. After leaving the Caguas Art Museum, we walked to the other side of the Santiago R. Palmer Square to Casa Rosada, the pink house, the place where Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, known to his friends as Charlie, lived most of his adult life. So who was Charlie, and why was he so important for Caguas and for Puerto Rico? On April 29, 2001, Pope John Paul II beatified Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, the first and only blessed of Puerto Rico, a lay Benedictine tertiary and Catholic theologian who stood out not only for his academic career, but also for his love of Christ and the Holy Eucharist, as stated by those who knew him. In other words, he's the first Puerto Rican on his way to be named a saint by the Holy Catholic Church. The Pink House is a recreation of his time on earth and the moment when he was beatified. The attendant showed us throughout the house and gave us detailed information about this distinguished cagüeño. After leaving Casa Rosa, we had one more place on our minds. It was the greenhouse where Abelardo Diaz Alfaro used to live. Abelardo Diaz Alfaro was a Puerto Rican author who achieved great fame throughout Latin America during the 1940s. 
His book, Campo Alegre, is a text that has been studied at schools in Austria, Australia, Canada, England, New Zealand, and all over the Americas. Sadly, we couldn't find the place, so we headed home at around 4.30. Caguas is one of those places where you could spend a week if you wanted to. The city is clean and well kept. Its network of museums and public spaces offer an excellent opportunity to learn about the history of the town as well as Puerto Rico's. For Puerto Rico by GPS, this was Orlando Mergal. See you next time.